Huh. This is Calicat the Calicaster, and this is a quickie review of Lamentis, uh, the latest episode of Loki, season 3. Uh, I'm not doing a full long review of any of them, really, because they're basically silly, and so I don't need a, <laughs> a sort of a Marvel version of silly. Uh, yeah, this, this one takes place on a uh, planet where where there is, oddly enough, there's a planet crashing into a moon instead of vice versa. And there's this yeah, a jazzy old song at the end, Dark Moon, which is kind of fun in there. But in the beginning it said, and the song, you know, uh, we, we gave, we, this is a uh, planet hell type of show, show where they put you on a planet and it's mostly about people on a planet. It's Loki interacting with his variant Sylvia. Sylvie. Uh, yeah, also uh, very much like Space Time Eye uh, planet. Um, from, uh, but I may have gotten Sylvie from Marvel. So, yeah. Uh, actually, no. No, I didn't. Actually, Sylvia comes from someone else. It comes from somebody from Evergreen that I named the character Sylvie after. So, uh, so that's different. So somebody from college. Um, it's different silly. So, it's a different one. Um, in this version, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, um, uh, it's a, it's an alien. So, yeah. Um, uh, she's the Sylvie variant of Loki. So she's a lady, lady variant of Loki. So they combined elements of two different variants of Loki. There are variants of variants. And the uh, Kafkaesque nature of the TVA has given away in the story. Uh, that they're all apparently brainwashed from the beginning. They even find that from that scene where she's in the very beginning talking to one of them, gets inside their head about the brain freeze and stuff, and finds out that uh, like, like she she somehow was recruited, and that's kind of implied there in the, in the story. Um, they're uh, Kafka-esque slash uh, less Stalin-esque sort of weird thing going on. Um, uh, Again, like Brazil, uh, Terry Gilliam, very, very much so. Uh, a, a little bit like the uh, some of those, some of those uh, the director of uh, uh, I Love Dogs and stuff. Oh, yeah. Wes Anderson, a little bit like Wes Anderson too. But Wes Anderson was a fan of Terry Gilliam. So, yeah. um, so we have, um, yeah, the um, Rushmore kind of thing. Yeah, their whole world-building thing is um, in, in the story implicit. It's this moon, which is not a... It's a deep Marvel story. It was, it was well, In other words, very, very uh, little was mentioned of Amentius, uh in the story. Uh, uh, it was uh, some of them, but it was a long time ago. And, and it was... Uh, you know, sort of, and, and I don't think the Lokis were involved in the comic book version. I think they're just kind of inventing their own thing. Which is fine. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, so they go to the planet. They, they crash there on this, on this moon that that planet is destroying itself. You'd think they would have just kind of reversed that and made it like, no, the moon is crashing down to the planet. Because that's not really how gravity works. Uh, it would be the other way around. A smaller body of mass would be falling down onto a larger body of mass unless some sort of crazy space god was messing with gravity well, uh, they go to the planet and they um, they encounter a lady they try to trick her it doesn't work, they try to trick the lady and then uh, they, they keep going to a train station to try to get on a train to get to the space arc that's going to take them off the planet a la the 2012 movie well, uh, several other movies have dealt with space arcs trying to leave a planet that's being destroyed, so it's it's not like it's from that. Uh, the the, uh, the the cities in the story, the towns, they cross between western towns and something out of uh, uh, cyberpunk era, a lot of neon and stuff like that. A lot of the final city they're in looks like a Vegas type of place with lots of neon signs and things. Um, yeah. Um, uh, they they uh, mess up the train thing because Loki gets drunk, and Sylvia has to rescue him. Then they have to like get off the train. And 
they get thrown off the train, actually. And then they have to walk to the city anyway, and somehow they get there, um, because they're space gods, uh, demigods. Um, yeah, so, so they didn't really need a train, but I guess gravity is in flux or something, because the planets are destroying each other. The space arc ends up getting destroyed, and they're trapped on the planet. Hence the cliffhanger at the end of this episode. Uh, so next one is Lamentia Part 2, possibly. Because they're kind of trapped on the planet. Um, they do reveal, however, though, that the that all of the Timekeeper people are variants. They've all been brainwashed in a sort of quasi quasi wink nod at the uh, at, at certain political parties that are convinced their leaders that won an election, didn't, and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's clearly a wink to that. Um, you didn't, the other guy won. <laughs> Certain political parties. Uh, and they're still obsessed. Think he's gonna return, he's gonna return. This is kind of that there, too, in here, in these, these space lizard aliens, they're, they're, the timekeepers are, uh, yeah, clearly, like, the reptilians from space lore or whatever. And, yes, in Marvel, that's what they were thinking of, too. The space lore reptilians. Not that we haven't used reptilians and lizards and insectoids before. Right, the insectoids they imply in the story are a Borg-like, hive-like race, uh, similar to that. Starship Troopers as well, uh, which I believe Marvel did it first for Starship Troopers, the movie, but the Starship Troopers book predates when Marvel did it, so they were probably cross-pollinating with bugs. Uh, uh, the the saga of Canary Space, one of my novels, has insects and bugs and lizard people and all that, and uh, space aliens and stuff. But in that one, um, they're not. Um, they didn't. They didn't build the pyramids or something silly like that. They just manipulated humanity to do other things, um, which is more what the uh, aliens of the of that lore do. But. Uh, but yeah, I was not thinking of Silurians or whatever, stuff like that. I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking of like alien races, cool manipulating people. Like, ah, uh, kind of that would be cool. Subterfuge, you know. <laughs> yeah, in this case, it's kind of the same thing. They kind of have a uh, sort of dystopian, weird Brazil thing. Again, that movie, Terry Gilliam movie, Society. And I keep thinking Brazil, but if you don't know what that is, it was a Terry Gilliam movie in the 70s where, or early 80s, where a Kafkaesque society had developed where everyone was programmed to go into the society and kind of like a remake of Metropolis, but with people. Uh, uh, Metropolis was the first uh, sci-fi movie years ago, and a silent movie um, with, a, with a musical score done ever. Uh, one of the first ones, and, and very famous, um, I don't know where they got the name Metropolis from, from Superman. They got it from Metropolis. And city. It just means city. It's city. Greek. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, so Brazil was about this working man who works in this, in this dead-end job. They did the same thing in Life of Brian, too. <laughs> they seem to like that kind of thing. Uh, it's very a dead-end job, but everything is weird and Kafkaesque and strange and things are going on and and then it becomes more Andy Warhol and even weirder at the end because, you know, and the idea is the song Brazil, uh, the Brazil, the Brazil that I knew when I waiting there for you, you know, uh, he, it's, it's the, the, Terry Gilliam had explained it years ago is that he got the idea from seeing a guy on this devastated beach post-World War II, the beach was all wrecked, and he's happily listening to this Brazil song just sitting there on the beach and it's completely wrecked around him and he's just like Brazil <laughs> and he's just like oh that would be so brilliant for a movie I should do that this guy like he's totally oblivious to what's going on and they put him in there in a movie and, um, and this movie was infamous because it had the Love Conquers All ending apparently the, the censors in America here in America didn't like the ending so they basically cut it off so that they just end with him escaping with the, with the, uh, the, sort of the badass chick at the end, and they get in a car and escape. But actually, the real ending, which was released in the Criterion version in the 2000s, and the real ending 
uh, uh, right after that, he's in the Kafka as uh, insane ward, and he's all he always just imagined the entire thing. All the ending, his escape, he didn't really escape. They just made him think he did. And he was imagining it. And then they tried to get to him again to like probe his mind. But he had lobotomized himself. At the end, he's like, oh, he's gone inside his own mind. We can't get to him. No! And then the end credits roll. Much more messed up, twisted, messed up ending. This one had kind of an ending like Ice Pirates. <laughs> so it ended like Ice Pirates in this one. So yeah, there's time warp. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's funny how they can speak English too. I and mean, we had we had the Loki guy singing songs and being drunk. And stuff. Uh, he gets into it. The two Logies get to know each other. I take it they're like siblings. So yeah, they're not going to shag or anything. That'd be weird. They're siblings from different universes. Of course, there's a joke about with Star Trek action figures. If you've got two of the same figure, you know, how, how else would you love yourself? Mm, you'd know everything about yourself. Mmm, hence Brazil as well. Um, there is elements of that in there in Brazil. Yeah, so this movie is very much influenced by Terry Gilliam. And uh, not, as, not as much humorous like like Monty Python and Terry Gilliam were, but uh, more like subtle and weird. Sort of an odd thing, uh, dark comedy bent. Um, yeah, and if they're all, they're all programmed in their hive thing. Yeah, so they're part of... They've combined the Timekeepers with the Hive thing, even though technically they should be lizards in the Timekeeper land, and the Hive people are the bug dudes, the bug guys, and they're related to sort of super Cree. Uh, the Lamentia is a Cree planet, in the Cree zone, so they should have been Cree, but they weren't painted that way. Also, I know that name sounds familiar, because there are uh, native uh, uh, American natives we called the Cree as well, where they just weren't thinking. <laughs> in Marvel, they were like, oh, this name sounds cool, I'll just use it. Uh, they weren't thinking of the Cree from the Canadian area. They were just, that name sounded cool, so we'll use it. Sort of like if they called them the Blackfoot. From another Indian tribe. Uh, local, local. <laughs> uh, or the Ohlone or something. <laughs> Be like, okay, yeah, um, sure. Or our uh, grandma, grandma, uh, grandma naps uh, from decades ago in Michigan. That would be the Obajai and the Apongwa. Apongwa? Apongwa. <laughs> that group. Uh, over here is Alone. I don't know. I, I, don't, I think I might have met some Alone. But I, think, I think that girl from Evergreen, Cecilia, was part Alone. She had a little Alone in her. <laughs> It's possible that there's a little Ohlone in, in, in Big Tim's uh, wife, well, the Henny. She may have a little Ohlone in her, too. It's possible. Anyway, so, no, no, they would have to do a DNA test. I have no idea. Anyways, so, yeah, we had nothing to do with Loki, the series. Um, there was uh, the train thing and all that looked like a, looked like Morton Roadkill was one of the guards. But <laughs> yeah, so. And uh, yeah, so that was it, pretty much. Um, is that what he was up to? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> the police space car. Yeah, had this helmet on. Okay. Walked up to Loki and like, ah, zap. It's all green screen. You know? It's funny that some of them had masks on, but not because of the thing, because of COVID. Anyway, so yeah.